Thank you very much for joining our webinar, The Bomb on My Back. Um, we're welcoming people from um, the UK and across the world. So very, you're all very, very welcome. This webinar has been in, um, organized by Greater Manchester and District Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament. And as you know, today we are marking the 75th anniversary of the atomic bombing of Nagasaki by hearing about the human cost of, of nuclear weapons. Society has become habituated and hardened to the use of statistics as a way of presenting death and physical and mental trauma. 2020 has become a year of statistics, 50,000 plus dead in the United Kingdom from COVID-19, 135 and rising dead and 5,000 wounded and a quarter of a million people made homeless in the Beirut explosion. And for 75 years, we've been told about the hundreds of thousands of victims of the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So today, we will remember two survivors of the Nagasaki bombing. We will know their names. We will hear about their lives and we'll bear witness to their experiences. And after today, we hope you will remember that it's up to us, to all of us, to make sure that it's the people that are remembered, not numbers, remembered as members of our society. It's also up to us to tell our governments that it's not okay, not normal, to use nuclear weapons as a fear tactic to threaten and terrorize other peoples. Today, we will hear from two speakers, one from the United States and one from Japan, after which time we will have time for um, questions, so your questions. And please, while you're listening to the speakers, please put your questions into the chat box. This is also being recorded, by the way. Um, so if anybody wants to see the recording of this, it will be on YouTube and we'll send, we will send everybody the link um, afterwards. We've got all of your email addresses. So let me introduce our first speaker, who is Joseph Gerson. Joseph is executive director of the Campaign for Peace, Disarmament and Common Security. He currently serves as the American Friends Service Committee's Disarmament Co Coordinator as Director of Programs in New England and as Director of the Peace and Economic Security Program. He is also a Vice President for the International Peace Bureau and co-convener of the International Peace and Planet Network. He's also an author and his books include Empire and the Bomb, How the US Uses Nuclear Weapons to Dominate the World, With Hiroshima Eyes, Atomic War, Nuclear Extortion and Moral Imagination, and articles on the Nuclear Weapons Ban Treaty, Asian Pacific Peace and Militarization Issues. Joseph also helped to edit the memoirs of Taniguchi Sumitero, The Atomic Bomb on My Back, which is the title of our webinar. The English translation of which is now available on Kindle. So if you check out the link in the chat box, we'll, um, you'll be able to um, buy that. So thank you very much. Thank you, Joseph. get myself on here okay uh sorry for the slow the little slow with the adjustment here uh let me first of all i just want to thank jackie for inviting me to join the webinar uh and i also want to call out an appreciation to ray street uh with whom i've worked over the years uh and i i see marcy green an old friend from uh she didn't want to know how far back in ancient history it is we're glad to see you there marcy the uh, title of let me call up a screen share here Sorry to be a little bit slow. The uh, title of today's webinar is taken from the memoir of one of the most tortured and courageous A-bomb survivors, Sumitero Taniguchi. In truth, we are all carrying the nucle nuclear weapons on our backs, in our minds, and in the future, we fear and hope will never come to pass. We cannot ignore the reality that all of the nuclear powers are upgrading their arsenals these days, that US, Russian, Chinese, Indian, and Pakistani military confrontations are on the rise, and we are just an incident or an accident away from escalation to the unthinkable. I've been asked to speak about uh, Yamaguchi-san and Taniguchi-san, the Bakasha, which is to say witness survivors of the A-bombs, who I had the privilege of knowing in the last decades of their lives. Let me begin with an observation, I don't know if this will let me do it,
Let me begin with an observation uh, from uh, Norma Field, a professor here in the United States. Uh, in her book, In the Realm of a Dying Emperor, she described the, quote, especially precious role of abused but courageous minorities who do battle for themselves and for majorities. Oppression and abuse are anything but liberating, yet movements for democracy, peace, justice, and human survival are in most cases led by those, who, those precious people whose wounds and life experiences make them sensitive to the suffering of others and to the dangers faced by the wider community. This certainly applies to Yamaguchi and Kanaguchi-san. Friends, the savaging of Hiroshima and Nagasaki with nuclear weapons was an ultimate expression of full spectrum dominance. The bomb's fireballs were about 3 million degrees centigrade. Thousands of children, women, and men were near the epicenters of the explosion and vaporized. You see elements of their remains along with schools, shops, hospitals, and the largest cathedral in Asia in the photos of the mushroom clouds. In Hiroshima, in the first second after the bomb's detonation, everyone within a Two mile radius was irradiated. This was followed by the blast wave that destroyed nearly every structure within a two mile radius. These were one mile in the case of Nagasaki due to the hilly, its, its hilly terrain and the plutonium bomb missing its target. The blast was followed by a heat wave that burned people and rubble indiscriminately. By year's end, 200,000 people had died. Cancers and radiation diseases have since killed many more. And in the early years, uh, genetic damage from the A-bombs uh, uh, led to uh, babies' deaths and mutations, including the birth of so-called jellyfish babies who were born with translucent skin and no bones in their bodies. Admiral Leahy, then the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, later testified that, quote, the use of this barbarous weapon at Hiroshima and Nagasaki was of no material assistance to the war. In fact, the determinative reason for the A-bombing was to bring the war to an immediate end in order to, for the U.S. to avoid having to share influence in northern China, Manchuria, and Korea. It was to escape the moral judgments that uh, President Truman lied about the reason for the nuclear attacks, claiming they were necessary to prevent casualties among U.S. troops who were being prepared for the invasion of Japan. In fact, for months, Japanese diplomats had been suing for peace on terms that Truman accepted after the A-bombings. The one sticking point uh, was the Japanese demand for Emperor Hirohito to remain on his throne. All the senior U.S. military uh, figures opposed the atomic bombings. Secretary of War Stimson advised Truman that Japan's surrender could be arranged, quote, on terms acceptable to the U.S. And, quote, he did not want the U.S. and the United States to get the reputation of outdoing Hitler in atrocities. Other generals and admirals joined him in this opposition. John Dower, the Dean of US Japan Studies, summarized what the people of Hiroshima and Nagasaki experienced. Quote, a fiery inferno peopled with monsters and naked tormented bodies, a raging inferno, streets full of monstrously deformed creatures, excruciating pain without medicine and without surcease. Outlines of bodies were permanently etched as white shadows in black nimbus on streets and walls, but the bodies themselves had disappeared. There were innumerable corpses without apparent injury and on. Senji Yamaguchi was then a student and had been assigned to digging trenches in Nagasaki's Urakami district, about half a mile from the epicenter in the very hot sun. He was shocked by the flash of light that turned everything blinding white before he lost consciousness. On waking, he was unaware that he had been horribly burned. Houses were toppled and burning. He heard people trapped in their homes crying for help. But like everyone else who seemed to survive, he focused on uh, surviving by escaping. He joined the movement of people toward the Urakami River, stepping over many corpses strewn on the ground. The river was, as he wrote, the, the river was completely covered with corpses. The incredible heat, people had, in, in the incredible heat, People had uh, jumped in seeking refuge. The corpses were everywhere he looked. Others were reduced to carbon. It was, Senji testified, uh, literally hell on earth. Only after crossing the river did he discover uh, his burnt skin was peeling and dangling. His burnt body and chest were blanketed. 
but he couldn't see his seared face. Senji made it to a relief train, bleeding badly and again losing consciousness. He woke uh, days later in the Amura Naval Hospital, where months later he met Taniguchi-san. Difficult as it may be to believe, Taniguchi had it much worse. He was a 16-year-old postman delivering unwanted draft notices and secret messages to war production factories in the Urakami district. He was about a mile from the epicenter when the blast blew him off his bicycle. He hugged the ground as it trembled like an earthquake. Two small children with whom he'd often exchanged greetings flew past him, quote, like pieces of dirt. A rock crashed into him and he kept telling himself, I will not die here. I will not die here. When he eventually raised himself, his shirt was gone and he realized that his left arm was badly burned and peeling and peeling skin hung from his fingers almost to the ground. The two children were dead. One burnt black, the other lying dead, but seemingly unscathed. He didn't know that his back had been completely burned. Having collapsed and unable to move, a factory worker carried him to a farm where people around him groaned and cried for water. After lying there for three days, almost completely without water or food, he was found and carried to an elementary school where the wounded died, carried out one after another. Taniguchi-san was eventually taken to the Omori Naval Hospital. For the next three years and eight months, he was hospitalized, lying on his stomach and barely moving for most of that time. Black goo dripped from his bed sores, which left an open wound that never completely healed. His bloody, almost, sick, uh, almost skinless back was constantly exposed, and he endured agonizing treatments that frequently led him to call out and to plead, please let me die. It was at the Omura Hospital that Yamaguchi-san saw this pathetic patient, and here, and, and here in 1946, that the U.S. Army took the photo of the boy with the bloody crimson back and near death. During their extended hospital treatments, the two Hibakusha became friends. Over time, each would have more than 20 surgeries, and like many other Hibakusha, each attempted suicide. As Yamaguchi-san later wrote, quote, for Hibakusha, the mental and physical wounds remain. They will never disappear. Many Hibakusha have been on the end of life, like walking on a thin rope. For them, living is as painful as dying. For Taniguchi-san, uh, there was constant pain, uh, anxiety due to his scars, and the ways that people looked at, at him and discriminated against him. Uh, he was also humiliated by the U.S. Atomic Bomb uh, Casualty Commission, which treated Hibakusha like guinea pigs, uh, in part to gain data for the design of new nuclear weapons. You know, as a Jew, when I think about Mengele, um, uh, this just cuts even deeper. Um, uh, he also suffered heartbreak after repeatedly being rejected for marriage. And this led him to uh, return to his birthplace to end his life. Looking out at the sea, he saw the faces of his postal colleagues and other A-bomb victims uh, who, who died. Uh, and he, quote, decided to outlive the tens of thousands of people whose lives were cut short by the A-bomb. This, he wrote, was the starting point of my commitment and dedication to the Hibakusha movement for the rest of my life. Yamaguchi, son wrote that for Hibakusha, the campaign against a and H bombs has been one of the reasons for not throwing their lives away. They came in the words of journal, they became in the words of uh, journalist Wilford Burchett uh, to represent the indestructibility of the human, of human resistance, the most stalwart and militant of peaceniks. They created the Hibakusha movement that has since inspired people around the world, not the least the diplomats who negotiated the Treaty for Prevention of Nuclear Weapons. It wasn't easy. A decade after the A-bombings, uh, these women and men began coming out, I'm not sure I'm on the right one here. Yeah. Um, hmm. I'm gonna go here. Uh, uh, a decade after the A-bombings, these women and men began coming out from their isolation, poverty, and hiding their terribly scarred faces and bodies. A few joined the first World Conference Against A&H Bombs in 1955. In the following year, they created Hidankyo, the nationwide Japan Confederation of A&H Bomb Sufferers Organizations. 
But along the way, they had to overcome the disempowering and pacifying Nagasaki narrative created with the deep involvement uh, of, of the US military. There you go. Until the end of the US formal uh, military occupation of Japan in 1952, it was forbidden for scientists, doctors, or others to meet and to learn about the causes of the suffering and diseases that resulted from the A-bombs, or to write about what had been inflicted uh, in the two A-bomb cities. To prevent criticism of the United States, materials related to the bombings, as a quote, uh, that described or portrayed the human destruction in detail were suppressed because they might invite resentment. Newspapers were censored and forbidden to have the kanji, the language characters, for the words atom and bomb. Film footage taken by Japanese journalists in the immediate aftermath of the A-bombings were seized and hidden away in a Pentagon vault for 20 years, lest they be used by uh, Soviet propaganda. Even people's grieving was strictly controlled. Just outside the Hiroshima Peace Park is a monument that pictures three schoolgirls. One holds what appears to be an open book with Einstein's E equals MC squared formula in bold letters. The statue memorializes hundreds of girls who were vaporized by the A-bomb while creating fire breaks against the possibility that Hiroshima, like other Japanese cities, would suffer massive firebombing. To, uh, to communicate that the memorial was dedicated to those children, military censorship had to be circumvented, hence the code E equals MC squared. Perhaps the most famous book about the Nagasaki A-bombing is Dr. Nagai Takashi's Bells of Nagasaki. Nagai was a devout Nagasaki Catholic, an anti-communist, and a doctor who cared for patients and wrote, prol pro wrote prolifically over the six years that he was dying from radiation in, uh, inflicted leukemia. The Urikami district of Nagasaki, the epicenter of the A-bomb, was largely Catholic, and it was over the largest Catholic cathedral in Asia that the fat man plutonium bomb exploded. The Bells of Nagasaki was the first Japanese published account of the A-bombings. The guy taught that the Hibaka should not feel anger. Instead, he preached that the A-bombing uh, of Nagasaki was, quote, God's providence, that the U.S. was not to blame. He wrote that before the A-bombing, quote, not a few cities were totally destroyed, but these were not suitable sacrifices, nor did God accept them. Only when Nagasaki was destroyed did God accept the sacrifice. Even this was not enough for the occupation authorities. They refused to allocate the scarce paper, ink, and glue for the uh, book's publication until Nagai consented to include the so-called Manila Annex, an unrelated account of Japan's occupation and atrocities uh, of the Philippines, in order to demonstrate that the Japanese, not the US, were culpable. The book was then distributed across Japan by the tens of thousands, framing popular uh, Japanese understandings of the A-bombings. This was the framing that, not, that, that Taniguchi and Yamaguchi had to overcome. This book, combined with the Urakami being a minority Catholic district and the city's father's conservative strategy for winning government reconstruction funds, stacked the cards against the challenging truths of Yamaguchi, Taniguchi, and other conscious Hibakusha who were angry uh, in desperate need of medical and financial assistance and committed to ensuring that no one else would suffer the hell that they had. Hibaka suffered, suffered in near total silence until the World Conference Against A&H Bombs. The massive, that massive event rose out of what Japanese experienced as the third atom bombing, the catastrophic 1954 U.S. 15 megaton bikini H-bomb in the Pacific that irradiated and killed Marshall Islanders, Japanese fishermen, and poisoned much of Japan's food supply. Uh, I'm a little bit ahead of myself here. It was at that first world conference that Hibakusha first spoke publicly. Uh, Misako Yamaguchi, an Avon maiden, explained that she had spent every day in great pain. She could not remember how many times she had wanted to die and asked, if we, the Hibakusha, die, who will tell the world about our suffering? And this applies to us now 75 years later. Following the conference, she invited Yamaguchi-san uh, to a small meeting of Hibakusha. He subsequently invited Taniguchi to join a meeting of 14 other A-bomb survivors. And in the months that followed, the Nagasaki A-bomb Maidens Association 
and the Nagasaki A-bomb Youth Association, which included Yamaguchi and Taniguchi, were merged, laying the foundation for the creation of Hidankyo. Their founding assembly issued three demands, development of a movement against A&H bombs, promotion of a government of government funded medical treatment and self-reliance for Hibakusha and compensation and support for bereaved Hibakusha families. Senji was a force of nature. Uh, I just wonder where I am here. Oh, okay. Uh, it was a force of nature, uh, even known to escape hospitals to speak at conferences, including uh, the World Conference and one that I organized at MIT here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He is best known for two things. First is the photograph of his tortured face published in a booklet by Hidankyo, which to this day is viewed in peace museums and books published around the world. Seeing his photo, you can understand why frightened young children ran from him, thinking he was the red devil. The other was his powerful 1982 speech uh, to the UN special session on disarmament. Speaking from the General Assembly's podium, Senji announced the presentation of nearly 29 million petition signatures urging nuclear weapons abolition. He made reference to his unhealing scars that all could see and described having seen people with extruding eyeballs and weeping young mothers frantically holding on to their lifeless, all but decapitated babies. And in his inimical way, Senji roared, we can wait no longer pressing the call to, to educate the world's people about the effects of the A-bombings, to negotiate an international convention outlawing the use of nuclear weapons as a crime against humanity, and to achieve a time-bound nuclear disarmament treaty. My favorite memory of Yamaguchi-san, uh, which illuminates his place in Japanese culture and history, is from the official Nagasaki commemoration about 15 years ago. There wasn't room in the Peace Park for the delegation I had joined to be seated. So we watched the ceremony on television. After Prime Minister Koizumi, Hibakusha, the mayor, city council members, children, and other dignitaries had laid their memorial wreaths uh, and made the symbolic offering of water uh, for the spirits of the dead. And after the reading of the city, uh, city's official peace declaration, standing beneath the world's ugliest, one of the world's ugliest statues, Prime Minister Koizumi began his oration. Midway through his speech, a TV news anchor interrupted, saying, quote, the Prime Minister is still speaking. We will now turn to interview Senji Yamaguchi, a leading Nagasaki Hibakusha, to get his view on these events. The Prime Minister of what was then the world's second greatest economic power was cut off mid-sentence on the country's largest television network so that an abused and tortured pathetic peace activist could be interviewed. A Japanese friend then whispered to me, that's Senji Yamaguchi. Coming to the end here. Taniguchi was in constant pain, uh, but he was, he was a more humble figure than, than Yamaguchi. He was, shy and a, he was a shy and soft-spoken man. He preferred doing his movement building from the background. But that changed in 1970, when one of the first color photographs of a horribly wounded Hibakusha was published in Japan's leading newspaper. It pictured a boy, Taniguchi-san, near death and featured his bloody crimson red back. The photo was taken from film shot at the Amura Naval Hospital in 1946. As the image was broadcast on Japanese television and around the world, uh, Taniguchi-san uh, uh, with the reddened back became famous across Japan and around the world. This man in constant pain and long reticent to tell his personal story, realized that once the photo of his tortured body had become an international icon, he was obliged to come, become a leading public figure. His life was transformed a second time. He courageously pushed himself to speak to one journalist after another, accepting invitations to speak at meetings and rallies. Excruciating pain was his constant companion as he traveled Japan and the world. Still, he spoke humbly, but with unparalleled determination. Perhaps the high point for Taniguchi-san was addressing the 2005 Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty uh, Conference at the UN from the same uh, podium uh, that uh, his friend and mentor, Senji Yamaguchi, had addressed uh, the 1982 special session. Three striking images of Taniguchi-san remain with me now that he is lost to us. 
First is the memory of Gensukio's general secretary introducing me to him at a, re at a reception, telling me that he still had open wounds, and Taniguchi's soft-spoken greeting and equally soft handshake. Second is Taniguchi-san standing with uh, George Martin, pictured here, uh, as he patiently accepted an award that we presented to him at a New York conference on the eve of the 2015 MPT review. My last strong memory of him is of a happy man, singing and wearing a colorful hat that had been given to him as we closed the World Conference in Nagasaki. It brings tears to my eye that midst it all, Taniguchi-san could smile, sing, and feel joy. Friends, today's average strategic weapon is 20 times more powerful than the two that savaged Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Even a small exchange of 50 to 100 of the world's estimated 3,720 deployed strategic weapons could result in the immediate deaths of 20 million or more people. It would be followed by the deaths of as many as 2 billion people as a result of the fires and smoke uh, that would cause global cooling and worldwide famine. Nearly all the nuclear powers uh, have first strike doctrines. On at least 30 occasions since the Nagasaki A-bombing, during international crises and wars, the U.S. has prepared and or threatened to initiate nuclear war. And every other country, uh, nuclear weapons power, including Britain, has done so at least once. This, friends, is simply evil. More, the bulletin atomic scientists recently set the hands of the doomsday clock to 100 seconds to midnight. The U.S. and Chinese militaries are confronting one another in the South China Sea, and the world's nuclear powers are engaged in extremely dangerous arms races. Senji Yamaguchi, Sumitero Taniguchi, and most of their friends and colleagues who launched the Hibakusha movement are no longer with us. With Hibakusha's average age now 83 years old, they will not long be with us. It thus falls to us to find, imbibe, and act from the spirits, courage, and vision of, of these people. Like Bertrand Russell and Albert Einstein, who urged that we remember our humanity and forget the rest, Hibakusha warned that human beings and nuclear weapons cannot coexist. My hope is that with the dangers of nuclear war increasing, we will use the 75th anniversary to rededicate ourselves to the survival of our species, and that we will take every action we can to build the popular movements needed to create a nuclear weapons-free and sustainable world. Friends, you got to keep on keeping on. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you very much. That was um, that was that was really moving, and it reminded myself of reminded me of um, friends that I made when I was at the um, World Conference, and how moving it was to hear um, Hibaksha speak. Very very moving. Next, we'll hear from Rieko Asato. Rieko has worked as the national staff member of the Japan Council Against Atomic and Hydrogen Bombs, Gensukyo, in charge of international activities since 1985. She's helped to organize a number of international conferences in Japan, including the World Conference Against a &H Bombs in Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Um, we've, heard, we've heard about that from Joseph. Um, and March the 1st Bikini Day events. In her role as a professional interpreter and translator, Rieko worked on the English translation of Taniguchi Sumitero's memoir, The Atomic Bomb on My Back, as well as Burned Yet Undaunted by Yamaguchi Senji, and the Japanese translation of The Empire and the Bomb and With Hiroshima Eyes by Joseph Gerson. Rieko was also involved with the 40th anniversary a Baksha tour in the USA in 1985. So please, Rieko, can I ask you to speak? Thank you very much. Thank you, Jackie, for the kind introduction. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. So thank you very much for inviting me to speak before you. I have a lot of friends in the Manchester area. So along with Jackie, Ray, Pam, and Jenny, and many friends. And also I have a lot of friends in CND all over UK because I, I lived in London for four years because of my husband's work. And it's a great, great pleasure for me to share this webinar with my longtime friend, Joseph Gerson. 
and in the peace movement and we have worked together on a number of projects especially on translating and publishing the books that Jackie just mentioned. So the Taniguchi-san's book was the, the fifth book that we worked together actually. And I've been asked to speak about the 2020 World Conference Against ANH Bombs and the Peace Wave. And actually both of them are the ongoing, very ongoing recent events. And I have been in the middle of organizing both. So I have to say that the content of my presentation was put together only in the last minute. And I apologize to Jackie, especially. She must have been very worried if I would really be online, <laughs> but here I am. Yes. So, and uh, Joe just already gave you a little uh, background of the Hibakusha movement and Japanese peace movement and the World Conference. But um, just to add, after the atomic bombing on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945, the Hibakusha have been left actually literally abandoned without any official help for almost 10 years. And many of them suffered so much with physical injuries and after effects of the radiation and the prejudice and discrimination in the society. And also the press censorship imposed by the occupation forces concealed a lot of facts about the atomic bombing and Hibakusha's suffering. So they have been tormented by both the US and Japanese governments. And it was in 1954 that the bikini hydrogen bomb test in the Pacific caused the sacrifice of the Japanese fishermen operating in the area. And this incident actually triggered the massive signature campaign in Japan and also worldwide against nuclear weapons, against A and H bombs. And as a result of the uh, nationwide anti-nuclear signature campaign, on which more than actually, more than 50% of the Japanese people around that time signed on. So that was more than 34 million signatures around that time were collected. The, world, uh, the first World Conference against A and H bombs was held in August, 1955. And Gensuikyo was founded next month in September 1955. And encouraged by the nationwide movement, Hibakusha got together and founded Nihon Hidankyo next year during the second World Conference against the NH bombs in, held in Nagasaki this time. The first one was held in Hiroshima. The second was held in Nagasaki. So ever since, the World Conference has been held with the three specific major goals. One, prevention of nuclear war. Two, total ban and elimination of nuclear weapons. Three, the support and relief for the Hibakusha airborne victims. So from the very beginning, Gensukyo's main campaign has been the signature campaign, the collecting signatures from the people on the appeal that we have. And our demand has always been a total ban and elimination of nuclear weapons, nothing less. And taking up important tasks for peace facing the world uh, at the time, over these years, we have held the World Conference for the last 65 years. And I have been involved in organizing uh, this kind of annual uh, general assembly. It is like the general assembly of the Japanese peace movement for the last 35 years. So I want to show you some slides that I put together with the help of my friend, Emiko, who is also on this webinar. So let me share the screen. So this one was the first world conference that Joseph was talking about. So from the beginning, this movement was very really international. We had a lot of overseas uh, delegates attending this World Conference. And over the years, we have had the delegates from CND. So this one from 2003, you can see, uh, see Ray Street chairing the session of the International Conference, International Meeting of the World Conference. And this one, yes, 
Jackie was with us in 2013 at a conference. This was excuse from the. You, excuse me, Rieko. I can't. Yes? I can't see your slides. I don't know whether anybody, everybody else oh, can. I'm. I'm very sorry. I, I. I'm not. I'm not really actually sharing it. Thank you. Let me see. Let me see. Okay. This one. Yes. Can you see it now? Yes. Now. Okay. Yes. This. So this one's a world conference. The first one. And we had the CND delegates in 2003. Ray Street is here. And Jackie is here. 2013 conference. This is uh, from the Women's Forum. And this one is uh, last year's World Conference 2019. We had Hannah Kemp Welch from London as the CND delegate. And this one also, this is a meeting from Nagasaki. Here's Hannah speaking in the uh, youth forum, the forum of the youth delegates, young delegates, and the citizens of Hiroshima. So all these young delegates are women, that was great. And because of the, the corona pandemic, we were not able to hold the World Conference this year like this in the traditional way. So, and we had, we moved everything online this year. So beginning uh, from the August 2nd international meeting, so this was uh, on the news, national news, NHK World Japan, we had international conference where Kate Hudson spoke representing the CND. And we had Seth Cotharo also IPB delegate, of course Joseph Gerson, the delegates from Korea, and Archbishop of Nagasaki and the Russian delegates also. So we uh, earlier today we had the very successful uh, Nagasaki Day Rally of the 2020 World Conference against ANH bombs. So that was the this picture I don't have, but this is that was the closing of this World Conference. We have the the recorded version of the different meeting of this year's World Conference from our uh, website. So I hope you will be able to see them. So next about the Peace Wave. So Peace Wave was first launched in 1987 when the, the delegates from the US and Russian uh, actually the Soviet Peace Committee around that time, that was still during the Cold War, they jointly called for holding the peace wave action at noon of October the 24th, the UN day of that year. And the idea was to start the action at noon from Hiroshima and Nagasaki and urge the peace movement in different time zones to take action at noon so that the waves of actions will circle around the world in one day as the globe rotated. So that was the, the concept of the first peace wave. And the peace wave action was called for five times since then until 1991. And we had the, the smaller scale peace wave, I think three years ago. And this time, time for the 75th fifth anniversary of the atomic bombing, we called for the peace wave. And uh, starting the action at Hiroshima on August 6, 8.15, the time of the atomic bombing, and to end the action on August the 9th at 11.02, the time of the atomic bombing of Nagasaki. 
So that during four days, the peace wave circled, circled around the globe for four days. And we, in the earlier Nagasaki Day rally today, we announced the conclusion of the peace wave at 11.02 Japan time. But I think the action is still continuing during the Nagasaki Day in other places. And this webinar in, uh, held by Manchester CND is one of the peace wave action and still going on in different parts of the U UK also, I, I believe. And I take this opportunity to thank our friends in the CND for your great support to the World Conference and the Peace Wave and many CND local groups joined with a variety of both in-person and online commemorative events, including this event, of course. And uh, most of the, uh, actually all of the, the actions that were communicated to us uh, listed in the Peace Wave News the uh, volume one, two, three. And I want to show you and, uh, what kind of actions were held during this period in Japan. This one, these pictures show mainly by the Shinhujin, New Japan Women's Association's activities during the peace wave, the three signature campaign, and the mobile exhibition of Avon photos in the street in standing action. Because of the COVID-19, people uh, refrained from using the light loudspeakers, but just stood silently on the street and spreading their banners and also asking people to give signatures for the Hibakusha's appeal. Many colorful tapestries were created, especially by the Shinhujin members. Like this. This one is from Osaka. And outside Japan, we want to show you some pictures from the Philippines. This is the park in Manila. They have the Japanese garden there. So they created the mural for the peace wave. And they set up the exhibitions of Avon photos next to the mural. This one is from France, Rennes, France in front of the, I think, in front of the submarine base of the French Navy, calling for the French government to sign the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. And this one we received from the people of Rochdale and Littlefield, I think near your place. Nice picture. And this one is from Aviano, in front of the Aviano US Air Base in Italy. This one is in New York. It's also the silent standing, the sitting action. And in Japan, this the signature campaign in support of the Hibakusha appeal was taken up as the common action during the peace wave. And there have been uh, almost 11 million signatures already collected in Japan, which will be submitted to the United Nations very soon, hopefully in autumn. And New Japan Women's Association alone has collected more than 1.32 million signatures and they set up this very impressive presentation inside Japan. And 
as you can see in this massive signature campaign, the Japanese people's aspiration for a nuclear weapon free world is very strong because, of course, because of the experience of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki atomic bombing. And we had a very inspiring news. This is also created by Amy. This is from the recent opinion poll says the nuclear weapons are not needed was the answer by the 85 percent of the Japanese respondents and also 70 percent of the U.S. respondents and 72 percent of the Japanese people think Japan should join the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons and also many people oppose a plan to build the U new U.S. base in Henoko, Okinawa to help the nuclear war. And now the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons have been uh, ratified by today, Nagasaki Day, we had another ratification. Do you know which country this is? St. Kitts and Nevis. This is the 54th country which ratified the treaty. It was very encouraging. We only have six more countries to go before the treaty goes into force. And we know that we are going to have a lot more reports on the outcome of the peace wave actions from different parts of the world, which I want to uh, compile in the more com comprehensive report after the Nagasaki day is over and send to you to share. So I hope you enjoyed this report. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rieko. Much appreciated, much appreciated. Um, <clears throat> and seeing those boxes full of signatures um, reminded me when I came to the um, World Conference and how incredibly powerful it was when the boxes started to be brought out and stacked on the on the stage. Um, I didn't realise I didn't realise um, what that was at first. And it might even have been it might have been when I was sat next to you, Joseph, and I think it was you that explained to me, and it just staggered, absolutely staggered me. And I took a, a photograph of that. We used to have. Um, an incredible, um, incredible campaigner called um, Basil Landau in Manchester, who was an absolute, absolute whiz when it came to collecting signatures. Um, and I knew that that would really, really spur him on to see that photograph. Mm. So it was a photograph that I brought for him. Yes. Yes. Uh, sorry, I wanted to show you just a short video to you mm. at the culmination of the peace wave. I'm not sure whether there's supposed to be some um, whether there's supposed to, we're supposed to be able to hear what these these people are saying, but I I can't. I don't know if other people can. Okay. Oops.
No, we still we still can't hear any volume, any any sorry, any sound on that. But it's um it's nice to see, nice to look at the beautiful, beautiful kites. Thank you. This is from the Philippines. Thank you. Incredible. In, in, incredible. Incredible. Those, those kites were just phenomenal. Very, very beautiful. Very, very beautiful to see. Very beautiful. Thank you very much, Ryoko. Oh. Thank you to both of our wonderful speakers, to Joseph Gerson and to Rieko Asato. Um, we really do appreciate you taking the time from your busy lives. I know you both are incredibly busy, um, but the fact that you've been able to join us today, we're very appreciative of. So at this moment in time, we could despair, couldn't we? But hearing these inspirational stories um, really should, really, really should give us hope. Um, and hearing about Kits and Nevis is another um, wonderful piece of information that I've, I've gleaned from today. Um, and it gives me it gives me hope. It gives me hope. So this week we heard that Ireland, Nigeria, and I'm not going to pronounce this correctly. So please do, if somebody knows how to pronounce Nui, does that sound? Um, they ratified. They also those three countries also ratified the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons this week, which is incredible. And it's the rising number of cities and towns across the world signing up to. Um, become nuclear banned communities um, that, that gives me a lot of hope and it's also hearing about Nihon Hidanko winning the Sean McBride Peace Prize this year um, along with the Black Lives Matter organization um, and uh, Hidanko um, won the Sean McBride Peace Prize because of because of the Hibakshas, because of the fantastic international signature campaign calling for the elimination of, of nuclear weapons so um, Please pass on our very, very, very um, warm congratulations um, because that is, is just fantastic. But none of this could have happened without individuals coming together and deciding to make it happen. We are not the numbers quoted when a protest or a demonstration happens. We are Jackie, Joseph, Reiko, David, Andrew, Ray, Pat, Ginsella, on and on. So please join in and help the peace wave to continue until we don't need it anymore. Please, if you're in the UK, join CND's Ban Communities Appeal. Get, go onto the website and have a look and see how you can make that happen in your town or in your city. And if you're um, an international, um, if, you, if, you, if you're on the international stage, if you're uh, one of our friends from Japan, from India, from the United States that's here with us today, please go on to the international campaign against um, nuclear weapons and you'll be able to have a look at the nuclear ban treaty and the ban communities um, information there and help help us to make it happen so thank you oh and i can't go i can't i can't i can't round round this um section up um without saying please join cnd because if not if not now when so please do do that Okay, so we're, I'm going to, um, we've got some questions. Thank you. And if anybody's got any more, please put them in the chat box. Um, the first question was, or is for you, Joseph. And it's from Norma. And Norma asks, do you know how long did uh, the US military occupation in Japan last? And do they still have a large presence? Yeah, so, so it sort of depends on how you want to count. So the, the, the formal occupation ended in 1952, uh, but it, it, wasn't, it wasn't an entirely um, uh, generous deal. Uh, the U.S. only agreed to uh, leave formally after the U.S. forced the Japanese government that it had created uh, to sign a military alliance that endures to this day. Um, to this day, 
I think there are on the order, what, of about 35 or so thousand U.S. troops uh, in Japan uh, with the greatest concentration in Okinawa. Uh, you know, some years ago with uh, a couple of uh, partners, uh, we had an interview with the U.S. Consul General uh, in Okinawa, and he forgot to put the meeting uh, you know, off the record until the end. So, so everything he said before that, uh, we could quote. And he was quite clear uh, saying that the entire island is a U.S. military base. Uh, you know, Rieko made, made reference to the effort to construct the, the, the air and naval base at Heneco. The resistance there has been remarkable. I mean, about 20 years at this point of dedicated nonviolent opposition, electing uh, members up to the parliament, the governor uh, opposed to the construction of, of the base. And, you know, the base is basically being designed to serve the U.S. through the 21st century. Uh, but, you know, popular opposition, uh, you know, one of the things that people here in the United States don't think about is our own Declaration of Independence uh, from British colonialism. Uh, if you read it, what it says was that King George III kept among us standing armies uh, in, in, in times of peace who committed abuses and usurpations. That was unacceptable. It was a reason to declare independence and even to go to war. And, you know, the abuses and usurpations that come with the U.S. bases are staggering. I mean, you know some of this from the U.S. bases in Britain, but I think it's worse in Japan, and especially in Okinawa. Uh, the crimes, the sexual violence, the environmental pollution, uh, the integration with, with U.S. Uh, wars abroad, Korea, uh, even as far as the Middle East. Uh, so the, the movement in Japan against the bases is also really quite, quite strong, and uh, Kensukiya plays a leading role with it. And we, as we can, we, we do solidarity actions um, to, to oppose the bases. Thank you, Joseph. Just also to say, I mean, the U.S. has a major Air Force base in Tokyo, in the nation's capital. So when you think about sovereignty and independence, think about that. Mm, indeed. Rieko, would you like to come, come back on that? It's, it's a pity that we still have more than 100 U.S. bases all over Japan. And the, the trainings that they have are just ignoring the people's lives. And that kind of training, like the low flight training with noises and sometimes dropping uh, different parts of the aircraft and thing, everything, sometimes a crash and things, can never be allowed to to be done in any other U.S. bases in Europe, and of course in the mainland of the U.S. And as Joseph said, the sovereignty of Japan has been infringed for a long time. And Japanese government is just acting as the, the sub servant of the United States government. And it, it's, a, it's a pity. And, and with this corona pandemic, people are more and more aware of the, the wasting of the tax money. And I think more and more people, we have to encourage more and more people to be aware of the, the military spending, not only by the Japanese own government, or the Japanese military is the, the biggest buyer of the US weapons, but not only that, but the hosting of the US bases is also a lot of money is spent by the Japanese taxpayers money and that should be made aware of by ma many more people so that we don't have to fund for that kind of purpose but to the, the lives and health uh, of the people now that many people are suffering from the pandemic and that's what we are stressing now thank you thank you um kate has asked um, she wonders whether um, Senji or Sumituro Teru, sorry, um, was speaking at an international physicians for the prevention of nuclear war conference in Moscow in 1987. Do either of you, Joseph or Rieko, know if, if that if one of them could have been the? the I'm not. You know, I'm not. I'm not remembering it. Um, uh, I, I I don't want to say no, but I'm, I'm certainly not remembering it. Mm. I'm sorry, I don't remember if 
uh, if that was in 1987, that must have been <clears throat> Yamaguchi Senji, but not Taniguchi. But I don't know if he was present. Okay, thank you, thank you. Sorry, Kate. You might have to do a bit more, a bit more um, searching on um, on Google. Um, Norma again has asked another question. Can someone say anything about the current problems in Japan, demanding that Japan um, signing the um, nuclear weapons prohibition treaty? Is there any any movement on that? Um, and is the refusal to sign um, something to do with U.S. influence? There's a bit of a theme here. Ooh. Yes, uh, oh, yeah, Japanese government, of course, but well, it refused to join the negotiation conference. It appeared just in the beginning and say a few words and then left the conference hall. So it never actually joined the conference. And it has uh, refused, Japanese government has refused to sign the treaty saying that, well, because they, I mean, Japanese government believes that Japan is protected by the nuclear deterrence offered by the United States, which is a fallacy, of course. And an interesting point was made by Mr. Kido, who was speaking in the webinar, uh, sponsored by Joseph and other friends in the United States, on, on the, atomic, the decision of the atomic bombing. But he was saying that the, the Japanese government has refused to give compensation or to redeem to the uh, hibakusha of their sufferings from the war and from the atomic bombing. And not only on the atomic bombing, but never to any civilians' uh, sufferings during the war. That was because that Japan has never admitted its uh, crime of committing in the, in the, in the war. And the, the, and the Hibakusha has always asked, for, uh, asked about this from the Japanese government as a pledge of Japan, uh, Japanese government, not to wage another war. That should be the, that is the purpose that Japanese, I mean, the Hibakusha constantly want the Japanese government to promise. And, and, and that's, and the giving compensation to the Hibakusha and to the war victims should be the proof of the Japanese government that it will fulfill that promise, which has been the promise, which must have been the, should have been the promise that Japan has made when Japan uh, promulgated the constitution of Japan in 1946, when the constitution was made and article nine explicitly said that Japan would not wage another war, I mean, not, not hold any war potential, not any military, which has been uh, broken, that we have the military called self-defense forces. But we should, I mean, Japan should come back to the, the point when we decided on Article 9. And that is, uh, Kido-san was saying that this is the, the duty of the, the Hibakusha as a citizen of uh, Japan who should be bound by the, the constitution. And it is very true. If I could just come in and say, you know, geography um, impacts, you know, how we, how we look at the world. Uh, but I, I want to emphasize the importance of, of people in Europe uh, paying more attention to the growing military tensions in, in Asia Pacific. Uh, and to, to uh, recognize that, you know, the U.S. has really since the Korean War uh, been pressing Japan and its government uh, to develop its military potential. Uh, and uh, if you read English language Japanese press in the last week, what you can read is that Japan is uh, now seeking to develop uh, missile capabilities uh, for first strike, be at this stage non-nuclear, but first strike attacks against missiles on the Asian mainland. Uh, you know, to appreciate that Japan despite its constitution, it has really become a major military power. And the, the um, you know, it, basically it, it's part of a, an alliance structure, uh, you know, United States, Japan, uh, Australia, uh, and India at this stage, uh, all circumventing and targeted against China. And one doesn't have to love the Chinese government, uh, but you know, the need to pursue common, sec common security diplomacy like that which ended the Cold War uh, rather than the military arms race is, is, is really where we should be 
going in. And if we're going to prevent war growing out of the Asia Pacific region, uh, we're going to need an international movement. Thank you, thank you. Obviously, um, CND would would agree wholeheartedly. Um, and as a as a as a lead on from that, Linda Walker um, has asked. Um, it's a follow on. Um, the Japanese Prime Minister Abe, Prime Minister Abe, is talking about Japan having its own nuclear weapons, and Trump is saying it's a good idea. So, do you think the peace movement in Japan really can stop this from happening? We have, we have so far prevented that from happening. And I believe that we can, because um, we have a very strong uh, support to Article 9 still. And Japan originally should not have any military forces. And of course, nuclear weapons we should not have. But uh, that was been the result of our constant campaign, especially by the Hibakusha sharing their experiences and telling to the world what really would happen, uh, those inhuman consequences from the use of nuclear weapons. And we should continue to do so with the help of the Hibakusha, but with a dwindling <laughs> number of Hibakusha, we really have to act like the Hibakusha, take over the work from the Hibakusha, especially the younger generation, um, as a peace movement, we have to hand over our work to the younger generation so that they can also create, they can be the main force to create their future. Yes, we will. We will stop it. Fantastic, fantastic. And I think on that really positive note, and I think it is, it is a positive because I really do believe we, we only have to turn turn the news on to see just how um, powerful people can be, individuals can be when they come together. Um, we hear this with our campaigning, what can an individual person do? Um, and I always say, and we always say, well, coming together is the, is the first thing, come together as a group and act together. And it's a very, very powerful, powerful thing to do. I'd like to thank you again so very, very much. We've gone a little over time, um, but I think that's fine. I hope people will forgive us because um, it's been so interesting. Thank you very, very much indeed. As we've said, this um, we've been recording this and it will be on YouTube and we will send the link around to everybody. And we'll include the links that um, you've seen in the chat boxes as, as um, Joseph and Rieko have been speaking. We'll send you all of those links as well. So if you miss them or um, you, you wanted to write them down, don't worry about that. We will send them. We will send them to you. Thank you very, very much indeed. Um, bye to everybody. Bye to our friends um, across the world that have joined us today. Um, and as Joseph said, keep on keeping on. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much.